Yes, indeed. And especially we're seeing the, the surging EV sales, especially in China and also in Europe, uh, really taking into uh, gasoline demand, but also in the United States. Um, there's been a lot of uh, talk about sales not increasing as much as maybe was expected, but EV sales and increased uh, efficiency, fuel efficiencies in the car fleet is lowering uh, gasoline demand, at least in advanced economies and particularly in China. Uh, you just mentioned China in this report as well. You said demand is there is still tepid. However, we are kind of getting mixed reports. Number one, there's been a lot of talk about overcapacity in China. Um, at the same time, we're hearing that consumer demand is kind of weak right now. So give us a sense. Beyond Q1, how do you see China impact in the oil market? So Chinese demand is slowing clearly. Last year, uh, in 2023, when China emerged from the COVID lockdowns, oil demand grew by 1.7 million barrels a day, 80% of the global total. So that's obviously very, very strong and was driving, dominating the oil market last year. China will still remain the largest source of growth in 2024 and even 2025, but growth is slowing from, as I said, 1.7 million barrels a day to about 600. This year. Um, and um, so we're seeing um, the petrochemical sector is, is the main driver, but also transportation fuels uh, that we saw were increasing last year as people got back to traveling after the lockdowns of 2022. Circling back to the uh, growing demand for EVs, Toro, do you think that structurally long term that will keep a lid on crude prices or not necessarily because as the incentive to produce wanes, we might actually see a scarcity of crude. Hmm. Obviously, the, the prices for oil will depend not just on, on demand, but on the, the balance between demand and supply. So it depends how the supply picture would evolve in the coming years. But what we're seeing is that the EVs will, will uh, eat into demand for gasoline. But for other sectors, such as aviation, you don't have clear alternatives today. Uh, for the petrochemical sector, we're seeing strong demand for plastics and petrochemical activity in China, but also in the United States, uh, for bunker fuels in the marine. Um, so these fuels will continue to drive growth in oil demand for years to come. Then uh, we're looking on the supply side. Um, as you noted in the introduction, we're seeing the Nanopic uh, Plus group uh, producers driving growth for third year running, led by the United States. Uh, for now, the growth from, from non-OPEC plus are exceeding uh, oil demand uh, expectations uh, while we're seeing a balance. But obviously, geopolitical uh, risk factors are also uh, impacting oil prices at the moment. I'm going to pick up on what you're saying about the non-OPEC plus supply gains leading the OPEC plus supply. And you put a little caveat there, only if the curbs stay in place. Do you think that those curbs would stay in place, though, for much longer, given that I can't really see OPEC plus wanting to cede market share gains to non-OPEC plus? Yeah. So we're already seeing the market share of OPEC plus has already declined uh, quite markedly uh, over the past years. Uh, the group has cut, uh, reduced oil production by more than 2 million barrels a day since the end of 2022. And the non-OPEC plus group has increased production by about the same uh, amount over that time. So the gap has increased by more than 4 million barrels a day just in, in space in less than two years. Moving forward, uh, we're seeing, of course, we don't know know uh, what OPEC plus is going to do and for now they've said that they will keep uh, the, the cuts in place until um, June and sec through the second quarter. Uh, our balance and suggest there is some room for them to increase production uh, in the second half of this year but in 2025 uh, we're seeing non-OPEC supply growth again exceeding our expectations for demand growth uh, so uh, there might be um, some pressure on OPEC to um, balance the market once again.